is uh, from the book of Exodus, chapter 33, verses 12 uh, to 33, or 23, excuse me. Let us listen for, for God's word. Moses said to the Lord, see, you have said to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. He said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I in your people, unless you go with us? In this way, we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, show me your glory, I pray. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you the name the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, See, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. And the gospel is from Matthew's gospel in chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. And again, let us listen for God's word. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show no deference to no one. For you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, whose head is this and whose title? They answered, the emperor's. Then he said to them, give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I came across these words by John Mark Green some time ago and wrote them down. Grief is love's shadow. The presence of an absence. And unbearable weight of emptiness. When I read those words, 
I almost immediately remembered uh, one of Richard Rohr's uh, favorite sayings. And he says, there are three major pathways, <clears throat> excuse me, to a deeper encounter with God. The experience of great love, the experience of great suffering, and the experience of this deep hunger and longing for God, which leads a person on a lifelong path, a lifelong practice uh, of, of looking to connect with God. And, you know, I think most of us at one time or another, uh, maybe it comes out of our experience of emptiness. Uh, we have this thought that we would really like to be able to have a deeper encounter with God, right? But then I think on another level, <clears throat> there's a part of us which understands that if we had such an encounter with God, it would be deeply challenging to us and unsettling to us, and either, even overwhelming to us. And so I think what we end up doing is we just, maybe it's un, an unconscious act, but we just get seduced by, uh, you know, the desire for security and comfort. And we, we, just, we just kind of fall asleep to this deeper longing uh, the, the depths of our own journeys and we, and, we, and we get seduced by comfort and we just go along on the surface of our lives largely asleep uh, to the greater realities that uh, our, our lives are the presence of God in and among us. And then we tend to create a story that we live our lives by that's, you know, largely we're kind of setting the tone of our lives. We're kind of control of them. And we expect that they've continued to go along largely the way they always had, uh, uh, along the lines of, of what we seek and want. But uh, if we're honest, we know that these stories that we live by, that comfort us, uh, are deeply illusionary. So Moses, the story of Moses, what I'm going to focus on today. So Moses had this deep encounter with God, right? Uh, he encountered God in this burning bush. And that experience forever changed his life. And it did not make his life, shall we say, easier or more comfortable. In fact, it did the exact opposite. It got him deeply out of his comfort zone where he was uh, called to become this, this leader uh, and to engage in a lot of risk, like confronting the most powerful man in the world, the Pharaoh, escaping with his people from the Pharaoh, and really having their backs up against the wall at the Red Sea, uh, the Egyptian armies coming and them largely defenseless. And except for some miraculous intervention at the Red Sea, they would have been goners. Then they get into the wilderness. The journey to the promised land is a 40 year long journey and uh, without the comforts of home. And so here's Moses, the leader, and the people are complaining constantly saying, why did you lead us out? into the wilderness. And then he gets led to the mountain where God gives him the 10 commandments. And so here's Moses, you know, providing uh, this incredible spiritual uh, leadership for the people. And while he's up there conversing with God, the people are down below, right? Making an idol of a golden calf. So what, where we pick up the text today is just one of those moments. And you, you imagine Moses had more than one moment in those 40 years in the wilderness where he was feeling vulnerable, where he was feeling discouraged. And he prays to God. He says, you know, God, in, unless you're with me, I don't think that I can do this. And God 
tells him, don't be afraid, I am with you. But well, Moses, he wants more. And he says, show me your glory. And God says, well, you know, I can only show you so much, right? There's only so much of me that you can receive and handle. So if you see my face, you'll die. <clears throat> and I believe that there's a, a deep truth in that, that there's only so much of God, only so much of the depths of our own lives that we can handle. And so most of the time, I think what we do, instead of seeking a deeper encounter with God, a deeper encounter with the depths of our own lives, we look for a way to hide, to protect ourselves from the unnerving reality, which really is our life. But Moses was hungrier and braver than most. And God honored his request, you know, hiding Moses, putting his hand over his eyes as he passes by. Then he takes his hand away and is allowed, Moses is allowed to see God's back. And I think that's such a beautiful story of saying that God will show us as much of God as we can take, as we can handle if we're hungry enough and brave enough to take that journey into that reality, which is way beyond us and way beyond our comfort zone. It made me think of um, an episode from Martin Luther King Jr.'s life and his biography I read many years ago. So he had begun his civil rights work and uh, was making waves. And one night, a white supremacist drove by and bombed uh, his house. No one was injured, but as you might imagine, it was deeply upsetting to King. You know, if you can't be safe, if you can't recharge in your own home, you know, how, how are you going to handle what it is that he was about? And so he was alone uh, in the wee hours of the morning at his coffee table, uh, feeling deeply uh, discouraged. And he prayed, he said, God, I don't think I can do this. And he said, in the stillness, he heard a voice and he felt this presence saying to him, don't be afraid. I'm with you. So thank God, most of us are not called to be Moses or Martin Luther King Jr., but all of us are called to deal with the deep realities of our lives and to open ourselves as much as we can to the incredible depths of God's presence among us. And just doing that a little bit is about as much as most of us can handle. Because by definition, we will be in way over our heads if we open ourselves truly to the presence of God. So we live in this profound time, right, of unrest and upset. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I feel like for most of my life, I was able to sort of like just live with this assumption that uh, the world was basically safe and secure for us. I mean, I think we and this country felt a little rocked back in the 60s, those of us who were old enough to remember that period. And, and certainly 2001, September 11th, kind of shook us to the core, just for the first time, most of us really feeling the vulnerability uh, of human existence. And in these past few years, I think all of us are feeling like, you know, the story that we live by, for so much of our lives that, you know, everything was safe, that we were secure, that uh, our structures uh, were holding us firmly in place and that we could just simply go with the flow and enjoy it. And not, not extraordinary much was being asked of it other than just to be a part of the system that seemed to be working so well. 
And now that story is really being shaken to its foundation. And I think with it, all of us are feeling so deeply insecure in our core. And you can sense it everywhere you turn. And it's, it's what lies behind all of the, you know, the, the anger and uh, all of the upset and, and the desire to fix it and to fix it quickly. But I think we're just in one of those periods of such profound shift, uh, of, of such upset and suffering and uncertainty and danger and risk that we can no longer simply coast along with the stories that have comforted us for most of our lives. That maybe for the first time in our lives, we're being called to uh, really go to our depths and to wake up to dimensions of ourselves and our world and of God that we have been asleep to. And while this call in some ways can be deeply exciting, it also is really upsetting and overwhelming. And we need to acknowledge that. I mean, here we are in the midst of all of this unrest and, and division. And our democracy seems to be hanging by a thread. Our, the health of our planet uh, is in jeopardy. And, and we're so divided, we can't even find a common place to, to gather from which to address these profound challenges before us. And so in this moment, what do we do? Well, maybe we turn to this story from Moses and we cry out to God from our depths and saying, God, I am afraid. I'm not sure that I can do this. I don't know what I will do in a few weeks if the election doesn't go the way I hope and pray. And if we listen, maybe we'll hear God say, don't be afraid. I know what's going on. I am with you. And then maybe like Moses, we say, God, show me your glory. I want to see more. And I think like Moses, God would say to us, are you sure? You know, uh, do you know what you ask? Are you ready for what this might mean? John Mark Green wrote of grief as love's shadow. The presence of an absence, an unbearable weight of emptiness. And I've tasted of that reality and my guess is all of you have too at one time or another. But there's something more too. There's not only the unbearable weight of emptiness, I believe there is the unbearable weight of presence that we long for, but yet we're not quite ready for. And we end up all the time just shutting our hearts to the profundity of the reality that we live. And we look for routines, we look for entertainment, we look for diversion to keep us away from the unbearable weight of our lives. The unbearable weight of God's presence, which overwhelms the story of our little selves. So one of the blessings of coronavirus um, for me uh, has been uh, Disney Plus. Uh, we've subscribed to Disney Plus for $7 a month because we have grandchildren and, and also because the Broadway production of Hamilton has been made available on Disney Plus. It was a few years ago, uh, Roseanne fell in love with the music of Hamilton and she would have it playing in the house constantly while she's working in the kitchen doing whatever 
I'm listening to all of the, this music that made absolutely no sense to me at all, but I'm beginning to hear uh, the lyrics. So um, now, because of Disney Plus, we've been able to see uh, this this show many, many times from the comfort of our uh, own home uh, at the Mans. And there's this one song in particular that always makes me cry. And the context is that um, Alexander Hamilton, if you don't know the story, uh, has an affair, which, as you might imagine, uh, did deep, deep damage uh, to his marriage with his wife, Eliza. And then their 19-year-old son, Philip, uh, is killed in a duel in which Philip is defending the, the honor of his father. And his father's advice before the duel is aim in the air, because uh, if the person is a man of honor, he will not shoot and kill you. But apparently he wasn't a man of honor because he shot and killed their son. So they move up to uh, uptown New York City, uh, where it was quieter, where they might find their way to healing. And there's this plaintive musical score. Uh, Eliza's sister, Angelica, comes in the wings and she sings these words. There are moments that the words don't reach. There is suffering too terrible to name. You hold your child as tight as you can and push away the unimaginable. The moments when you're in so deep, it feels easier to just swim down. The Hamiltons move uptown and learn to live with the unimaginable. So Hamilton appears alone on the stage and he starts to sing about the grayness of his guilt and grief, how he finds himself now taking the rest of his children to church and making the sign of the cross at the door and praying. And he sings that never used to happen before. Brokenhearted, he turns to God. And then Eliza and Alexander are side by side. And he turns to her and he sings to her out of his grief and guilt. And in the wings, Angelica appears again and she sings these words. There are moments that the words don't reach. There's a grace too powerful to name. We push away what we can never understand. We push away the unimaginable. They're standing in the garden, Alexander by Eliza's side. And she takes his hand and she sings, it's quiet uptown. And the chorus, forgiveness. Can you imagine? Forgiveness. Can you imagine? And Hamilton cries, and I cry along with him every time. Because we live most of our lives not being able to imagine. Not being able to love with a love beyond our small selves. And I cry because not only is there a suffering too terrible to name, but there is also a grace too powerful to name and such unnameable realities are the foundations of our very lives. If we only had the courage and vulnerability to open ourselves to the truest part of who we are, of whom God is in the midst of our lives. Great love, great 
suffering. This insatiable longing for God that leads us on a lifelong journey and the willingness to take a path to the very heart of God, the very depths of our lives. May God bring us to that place, the pathway to the unbearable weight of presence. And I believe if we don't take that journey, we just simply won't be able to deal with the reality, which is ours now, collectively, to deal with in our country and in our world. May it be so. Amen.